Hello, my name is Taya Graham and welcome to the Police Accountability Report. As I always say, the purpose of this show is critical, to hold the politically powerful institution of policing accountable. To do so, we go beyond the cases of individual malfeasance and examine the political economy which makes bad policing not just possible, but rampant. This is a breaking news edition of the show as we have new details about the federal government's efforts to arrest people for what they post on social media and how secretive they are about just how pervasive this law enforcement strategy really is. But before I get started, I want you watching to know that if you have evidence of police misconduct or brutality, please share it with us and we might be able to investigate. Please reach out to us. You can email us tips privately at par at therealnews.com and share your evidence of police misconduct. Or of course, you can message me directly at Taya's Baltimore or Twitter and Facebook. And please like, share, and comment. I really do read and appreciate your comments. Okay. Back to business. Last week, we reported on the alarming case of Michael Avery, an activist who was arrested by what can be best described as a phalanx of secret police, as you can see on this video. PR was able to obtain the underlying affidavit which led to his charges, and what was in it was disturbing, to say the least. The documents recount how federal officials were monitoring Avery's Facebook and how they concluded he was inciting a riot by misinterpreting his posts in the worst light possible. For example, they believed his call for shooters at a protest was violent, but in fact, he meant photographers. He also noted the protest was a red level event, which meant he only believed the encounter would include tear gas and aggressive tactics from the police. Nevertheless, for reasons that remain unknown, Avery was released, but since then, Another similar case has emerged, this time in Gainesville, Georgia, which raises questions about how far federal authorities will go to use our free expression against us. The arrest targeted Arturo Adama, a Black Lives Matter activist who has participated in a series of protests in Atlanta and had also been fighting for the rights of low-paid poultry workers across the state. On June 24th, deputies for the Gainesville County Sheriff's Office showed up at Arturo's home to question him about a series of Facebook posts. Arturo declined to speak to them, and subsequently, he was arrested and charged with making threats against police via Facebook. However, at this time, there were no specific details on what posts led to his arrest, nor the threats he made that justified the charges. I have personally reviewed some of his Facebook page and have not yet found any posts that suggest violence or specific violence against specific people. And while Arturo has been released on bail, the case against him remains in part a mystery, which is why I'm speaking with my co-host and reporting partner, Stephen Janis. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us. Taya, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. So Stephen, first, you've contacted the Gainesville Sheriff's Department. What have they told you about his arrest? Have they released any more information? They have said absolutely nothing. We will show on the screen now their two paragraph statement that they use to justify the arrest of this young man, this activist. Uh, it doesn't give you any details on what posts they're talking about specifically, just a very vague description of what they said he did on Facebook and that he had made threats against officers, but nothing specific. So, you know, I think it raises a lot of questions about exactly what they're up to down there. So how unusual is it for a law enforcement agency to arrest someone without releasing details? What does this tell you? I mean, from my experience as a reporter, you always get charging documents. Court documents are normally released because what happens in court is supposed not to be secret. As we pointed out last week, as you pointed out, talking about the trial in Kafka, where they said, you're being arrested, but we can't tell you why. That's not what's supposed to happen. Anything that happens in a court, which is where an arrest is effectuated, is supposed to be public. Now, I know you've been in touch with the FBI about how prevalent these cases are um, for arresting people for Facebook posts and public discourse. What did they tell you and what do we now know? Okay, so I reached out to the FBI several times. I finally got a call back and they said, no comment. The Justice Department has said publicly that there are hundreds of cases, but what I really want to know is how many cases are there like Michael Avery's? How many cases are based solely on someone's Facebook post? And they said they weren't going to comment, that there were hundreds of cases, but they aren't going to break it out, and that, as far as I can tell, are not keeping track of this. So it's, it's very difficult to tell. So let me get this straight. The FBI does not keep track of its arrests or arrest data from the protests? Well, that's what's interesting about it. Their comment was no comment. My question was very specific, what's the data? You know, one has to assume if it's no comment, they don't have it. And I would say yes, that answer that we don't know how many different FBI agencies, you know, or offices around the country are doing these kinds of um, cases. Well, we just don't know. There's no central database, no central reporting. You just got to basically surf the internet to find them. 
Now, you actually spoke to Michael Avery. What did he tell you about his arrest and the case against him? Well, let's look at the video right now. It's really interesting. We spoke to Mr. Avery, and he said it wasn't just two officers. He said they had 50 officers plus some sort of tank. So it was a military kind of style you know, arrest. And as you'll notice, there are no identifying um, information on the officers, no badges, no um, patches, whatever. I asked the FBI, they said those are FBI agents. So weirdly, I said, and I asked him another follow-up, you know, do you have a badge? What do you, what do you use to, to identify? And they did not respond. But he also said that he believes that the um, orders for his arrest came from the highest level of government, like from the White House. Uh, he didn't say, you know, Trump specifically, but that someone said, go out and get Black Lives Matter activists. I don't care how you get them. And, and this is a result. And, and most of all, Mr. Avery said that, you know, while he has a lot to say about this case, he feels like he can't say anything now because the case was dismissed with prejudice, which means they can still arrest him again. It's been a very terrifying situation for him. And, you know, he just wants his First Amendment rights preserved. But using Facebook posts to further extend the tentacles of law enforcement is not limited to criminalizing dissent. In fact, last year, we covered the case of Erica Hamlet and her son, Jawan. In 2017, Jawan was waiting for a bus when a man dressed in casual clothes approached. The man told Jawan he looked like trouble and then pulled a gun and pointed it at him. The aftermath of the terrifying incident was caught on Erica's cell phone, which you can see here. But what really upset Erica and traumatized her son was the fact that the man who brandished the deadly weapon was a Baltimore City police officer, Michael Durant. He had been off duty when the incident occurred. The family was so concerned about Officer Durant's careless use of a deadly weapon, they sought a restraining order against him. And it's what happened in that hearing that we're here to talk with Erica about today because it illustrates exactly how law enforcement is finding new ways to exploit our use of social media. Erica, thank you so much for joining us. Sure, you're welcome. <laughs> So Erica, first describe the events that led up to the scene that we're seeing on camera. What happened to your son? My son got out of school and he's picked up using a van service and he was waiting for the van service in a cul-de-sac nearby in Howard County where we live. He called my mother's phone screaming that someone had pulled a gun on him. We left the house, got to the scene, which was only like a, maybe a block or so away. When I got to the scene, I could see the gentleman off in a distance and I thought he was a kid or a man just approaching my son and was trying to rob my son because my son said he had a gun. As we got closer, I could see that he was an adult and I wanted to know why he was having a conversation with my 16 year old son and why he pulled a gun on him. None of the things about the gun and the fear, all of that had left my mind because I immediately went to him and started asking him questions. As we were talking, he never told us that he was a cop. And I say cop and not officer because there's a difference. Police officers protect and serve. Cops are rogue and they don't care anything about the public that they're supposed to protect. So this cop had approached my son. He had on a hoodie and blue jeans and tennis shoes. When we got to the scene, I called the police because I didn't know what was going on. When the police got to the scene, they didn't know he was a cop. And that's why on the video, you see them taking the gun from his hoodie because when they immediately got out of their cars, they said, who has the gun? And we pointed to the gentleman. Only seconds before the police showed up, did we find out that the man in the hoodie was actually a Baltimore City police officer. He was plain clothes, out of his jurisdiction and off duty when he approached my son and he never identified himself. Erica. Now, what prompted you to seek a restraining order against Officer Durant? After I tried to contact Eternal Affairs to file a complaint against the officer, I was totally confused about the process. When you look online, it was confusing. It was a Friday afternoon. They closed until Monday. So I was afraid for my son because this officer lived right out the back from us. So I knew that on Monday morning, my child would have to walk past this person's complex to get to and from school and I was fearful of that so I went to the court and I petitioned to have a peace order against him because I didn't want him to have to my son to have to encounter him and this happened to him again but Erica during the hearing lawyers for the officer brought up some interesting evidence what was it he had given the judge a stack of my Facebook post um, I'm pretty sure the first resource they used was to see whether my son or I had a criminal record, which we did not. So the next best thing for them to do was to use my social media. 
um, once he pulled those up and presented them to the judge, his argument was basically that I was inciting the community and rowing them up to get them to go on board to be against the officer. Um, the judge decided that I was using my platform to inform the community about what this officer had done to a 16-year-old child, which was pulled his gun on a 16-year-old child. Now, Juwan, this is a difficult question, but when you watched George Floyd's death on video, how did it make you feel? Um, I get kind of uh, iffy feeling in my stomach because it could have been me. If I would have like, uh, probably jumped at him when he pulled the gun out, it could have been me. Now, Erica Simpson, you have tried to hold Officer Durant accountable. Tell us what happened. They decided to charge him internally, which meant that his own police department was to issue out his punishment. Um, after the peace order was issued on him, Officer Durant was cited for several infractions. Um, during the time that Officer Durant was cited for these infractions, they let the statute of limitation run out on the charges actually being followed through for him. So I found out later that that is also a tactic of the police department. What they do is they'll have these meetings, the officers claim not to be present so that they can then go back and say that the statute of limitations ran out. Erica, what does your experience tell you about national efforts to reform police? What have you learned? All the events that's played out for the last few months um, about police accountability and social justice and systematic, systemic racism, it's a trigger for me. I um, I don't know how families like Mr. Floyd and Ms. Taylor and Elijah and Emmett Till's mom and Eric Garner's daughters do this and grieve at the same time. I don't understand because it's too hard. I know for a fact that Eric Garner's daughter probably died from a broken heart and exhaustion because I'm tired. I've been doing this for almost three years. I filed all of the things that you're supposed to be able to file. I filed for a Maryland Information Act, and I was told if I was nicer, I probably would get more information. I went to um, the CRB, which is the Civilian Review Board, and you have to make a choice. You can have a sit-down meeting where the officer can apologize, or you can follow, follow the case through like I did. You have to choose between the two. And people that work in the office didn't even know that. It's worth noting that using Facebook to accuse someone of a crime seems to be fertile ground for law enforcement. However, when the roles are reversed, the process is more treacherous. Take the tragic case of Corinne Gaines. Corinne was in her Baltimore County apartment when police arrived to serve a warrant for a traffic violation. After she initially answered the door holding a shotgun and refused to surrender due to her stated distrust of police, a SWAT team was called and a standoff ensued. While she was in her apartment with her son, Gaines started to broadcast live on Facebook to tell her side of the story, to explain why she felt police were overreaching and why she did not trust a justice system that would incarcerate a person over missing a trial for driving infractions. However, cops contacted Facebook and her feed was cut off. Eventually, both her Twitter and Facebook account disappeared. Bottom line, Gaines was silenced. And after several more hours, a Baltimore County cop shot her dead while holding her son in her arms. A lawsuit filed by her family led to a $30 million settlement, but the conflicted role that Facebook and social media play in the surveillance state is clear. Law enforcement can use our social media posts as fodder to criminalize our First Amendment expressions, but when the tables are turned, the corporate giants side with the powers that be. It's worth noting that this is the same company that allowed President Donald Trump to threaten protesters with violence, specifically his now famous quote of when, quote, the looting starts, the shooting starts. It seems when people in power subject us to threats, the multi-billion dollar enterprise is more forgiving. But when we, the people, utter harmless calls to action to petition the government, our right to free expression becomes criminal. Now, to be fair, we reached out to Facebook and asked them specifically about how much they cooperate with law enforcement during these investigations. They did not respond.
But I think it's telling that the company that is now facing renewed criticism over its reluctance to curb hate speech, misinformation, and racism would be seemingly so eager to help law enforcement arrest legitimate activists over seemingly less problematic pronouncements. To be clear, The Real News has reviewed the charging documents and Facebook posts of both activists and asked each agency, the FBI and the Gainesville County Sheriff's Office, for additional details about what prompted the criminal charges. And as we reported before, the post never once mentioned a specific threat against a law enforcement agent or a specific person. How the vague and seemingly misinterpreted calls to action became criminal remains unclear. Why someone like Michael Avery would require roughly 50 FBI agencies to detain him is again both unclear and troublesome. I mean, how exactly are we supposed to comprehend this coalition between a justice system which has been accused of overreach and unwarranted violence against its own constituents and a multi-billion dollar business which profits over the rants of political leaders who use pronouncements of violence like political currency. Consider a recent study about the effect of Fox News on the public's response to the pandemic. Researchers studying the attitudes of people who watch the conservative network found they were much more skeptical about the threat of coronavirus than those who did not. They were less likely to wear masks, social distancing, or believe in sheltering in place. In some, not only uninformed, but prone to ignore a deadly disease that continues to ravage this country. Think about it. While law enforcement officers spend millions of dollars parsing Facebook posts of activists who have legitimate grievances with a notoriously racist and overbearing criminal justice system, Fox News operates without constraint. While young protesters seek to exercise their First Amendment right to call out a police state that a majority of Americans think is biased and then they end up in jail, Fox News continues to promote dangerous falsehoods that are literally causing people to ignore a deadly threat. This is the type of contrast that reveals the very essence of what's wrong with America, the criminal justice system, a process of enforcing the law with favor for the few at the expense of the many, a reflexive bias to silence the afflicted while comforting the powerful. When these same elites issue threats against people who have risen up, when they make pronouncements about looters and threats to civil society, I feel I would be remiss if I didn't quote a favorite character from one of my favorite science fiction TV shows, Gaius Baltar of Battlestar Galactica. He said, if you hear the people, you never have to fear the people. I want to thank my guest, Erica Hamlet, and her son, Jawan, for joining us today. Thank you so much for being with us. And I have to thank my reporting partner, Stephen Janis, for his writing, editing, and research on this piece. Thank you so much, Stephen. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. And of course, I have to thank friend of the show, Noli D, for her help and support. Thank you, Noli D. And I want you watching to know that if you have evidence of police misconduct or brutality, please share it with us and we might be able to investigate. Please reach out to us. You can email us tips privately at par at therealnews.com and share your evidence of police misconduct. You can also message us at Police Accountability Report on Facebook or Instagram or at Eyes on Police on Twitter. Or of course, you can message me directly at Taya's Baltimore on Twitter or Facebook. And please like and comment. You know I read your comments, appreciate them, and whenever I can, I try to answer your questions. My name is Taya Graham, and I am your host for the Police Accountability Report. Please be safe out there.